things up my sleeve. But I'm just the opposite of a stage magician. He gives you illusion that has the appearance of truth. But I give you truth in the pleasant disguise of illusion. To begin with, I turn back time. I reverse it to that quaint period, the 30s, when the huge middle class of America was matriculating in a school for the blind. Their eyes had failed, or they had failed their eyes. And so, they were having their fingers pressed forcibly down upon the fiery braille alphabet, solving a condom. In Spain, there was revolution. Here, there was only shouting and confusion. In Spain, there was Guernica. Here, there were disturbances of labor, sometimes pretty violent. Cincinnati, Chicago, St. Louis. This is the social background of the play. The play is memory. And being a memory play, it is dimly lit, it is sentimental, it's not realistic. In memory, everything seems to happen to music. I'm the narrator of the play, but also a character in it. The other characters are my mother Amanda, my sister Laura, and the gentleman caller who appears in the final scenes. He's the most realistic character in the play, being an emissary from a world of reality that we were somehow set apart from. But since I have a poet's weakness for symbols, I'm using this character also as a symbol. He's that long delayed but always expected something that we live for. His fifth character in the play, who doesn't appear except in this photograph, this is our father, who left us a long time ago. He was a telephone man who fell in love with long distances. He left his job at the phone company and tripped the light fantastic out of town. The last we heard from him was a picture postcard from Mazatlan on the Pacific coast of Mexico containing two words, hello, goodbye, and no address. I think the rest of the play will explain itself.
chairs and up to accommodate them all, I would have had to send the nigger over to bring in folding chairs in the parish house. Well, how did you entertain all these gentlemen callers? I understood the art of conversation. I'll bet you could talk. Well, girls in those days knew how to talk, I can tell you. Yes? Yes, they knew how to entertain the gentlemen callers. It wasn't enough for a girl to have a, a pretty face, a graceful figure. Though I wasn't slighted in either respect. She also needed to have a nimble whip and a tongue to meet all occasions. What did you talk about? Oh, things of importance going on in the world. Never anything coarse or common or vulgar. My calls were gentlemen, oh. My, my calls were some of the most prominent young men in the Mississippi Delta planners and sons of planners. Uh, there, there was champ, young champ Larkin, who later became vice president of the Delta Planters Bank, and Anna Stevenson, down in Moonlight. Hmm? Uh, the Couture brothers were actually in base. <laughs> oh, Ace was one of my bright particular boats. He got in a fight with that wild one ride boy. They shot it out on the floor of Moonlight Casino. Bates was shot to the sun. It died in the ambulance on the way to Memphis. Oh. <coughs> he also left his widow well provided for eight to ten thousand acres, that's all. And, oh, <laughs> she married him on the rebound, never loved her. Carried my picture on him the night he died. <laughs> oh, and there was that boy that every girl in the Delta set a cap for. <laughs> that beautiful, brilliant, this few boy from Green County. What did he leave his widow? He never married. Oh, gracious. You talk as if all my old admirers had turned up their toes to the daisies. Was well, it the first one you've mentioned that still survives? Well, I bet you all went north and made a fortune, came to be known as the Wolf of Wall Street. Had the modest stuff. Everything he touched turned into gold. Oh, and I could have been Mrs. Duncan J.C. Too, mind you. But I picked your father. Mother, let me do the dishes. No, 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 dear. <coughs> now, you go study your typewriter chart or practice your shorthand a little. Be fresh and pretty. Oh, it's almost time for the gentleman calls to start arrive. Oh, I wonder how many we're going to entertain this afternoon. I don't believe that we're going to receive <coughs> any, Mother. What? No one? <laughs> Oh, you must be joking. <coughs> now, one gentleman called. Can't be true. There must be a flood. There must have been a tornado. It isn't a flood. It's not a tornado, Mother. I am just not popular like you are in Blue Mountain. <laughs> Mother's afraid I'm going to be an old maid.
just perplexed by why. Mother, I wish that you would tell me what has happened. And you know, I was supposed to be inducted my office in the DA office this afternoon. So I stopped over Rubicon's business college to speak to your teachers about you having a cold and you asked them what progress they thought you were making down there. I went to the typhoon and stopped to introduce myself as your mother. Oh, when she said, we don't have any such student enrolled in the school. Well, I assured her she did, and that you've been going to school since early January. <coughs> I wonder, she said, if you could mean that terribly shy little girl who dropped out of school after only a few days of ten. No, I said, Laura, my daughter, been going to school every day for the past six weeks. Excuse me, she said. And she got out the attendance book, and there was your name, unmistakably printed. Oh, and all the days you've been absent until they finally decided to stop out of school. Oh, I still said, well, there must be some mistake. There must be some mix-up in the record. Well, she said, I remember perfectly now. And shook so she couldn't hit the right keys. And the first time we gave a speech, test, she broke down completely, sick at the stomach, and almost had to be carried to the wharf. <coughs> After that moment, she never came back, called the house, and never got an answer. Oh, well, I was working, I suppose, at Famous and Bar Department Store. Demonstrating those. Oh. They're so <coughs> weak I could barely keep them on my feet. <laughs> I had to sit down when they got me a glass of water. Fifty dollars tuition. All our plans. All my hopes and ambitions for you just gone at this time. Yes. 
relationship. Oh, oh what, what is there left but dependency all our life? I know so well what becomes of unmarried women who are prepared to occupy a position. I've seen some beautiful cases in the South. Barely tolerated spinsters living on the grudging patronage of sisters' husbands. Or oh, brothers' wives. <laughs> Back away. In some little mousetrap of a room, encouraged by one in law to visit the other. Oh, little bird life women. Eating the crust of humility all their lives. Is this the future we mapped out? Well, I swear I don't see any alternative. It isn't a very pleasant alternative, is it? Mm. Of course I'm going to do marry. Haven't you ever liked some boy? <clears throat> yes, I liked one once. Mm. I came across his picture a while ago. He gave you his picture? No. <coughs> it's in the yearbook. Oh. Huh. High school boy. Yes. His name is Jim. And here he is in the Pirates of Penzance. The what? The operetta the senior class put on it. Oh, he had the most wonderful voice. We sat across the aisle from each other in the odd Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. Here he is with the silver cup for debating. You see his grin? <laughs> he must have had a jolly disposition. Mm. He used to call me the Roses. Why did he call you such a name as that? When I had that attack of pleurosis, he asked me what the matter was when I came back. And I said pleurosis, but he thought that I said blue roses. And oh. so that's what he always called me after oh. that. Whenever he saw me, he'd holler, Hello, Blue Roses. I didn't care much for the girl that he went out with, Emily Meisenbach. I mean, Emily's the best dress girl at Solden. But she never struck me as being sincere. Said in the personal section they're engaged. That's six years ago. So they must be married by now. Girls that aren't cut out for a business career usually wind up married to some nice man. Oh, <laughs> sister, that's what you do. Mother, what? I'm crippled. Nonsense. I told you never to use that word. You're not crippled. You just have a little defect, and it's hardly noticeable. <laughs> and when people have some some disadvantage like that, well, they they cultivate other things to make up for it. They they develop a charm and, and vivacity and and charm. One thing your father had plenty of was charm. <gasps> Fiasco on Rubicon's business college. The idea of getting a gentleman caller for Laura began to play a more and more important part in Mother's calculations. He became an obsession, like some archetype of the universal unconsciousness. The image of the gentleman caller haunted our small apartment. An evening at home rarely passed without some allusion to this, this image, this specter, this hope. And even when he wasn't mentioned, his presence hung in Mother's preoccupied look and in my sister's frightened, apologetic manner. It hung like a sentence passed upon the wing field. Mother was a, <laughs> a woman of action as well as words. She began to take logical steps in the planned direction. Late that winter, in an early spring, realizing that extra money would be needed to properly feather the nest and plume the bird, she conducted a vigorous campaign on the telephone, roping in subscribers to one of those magazines for matrons called The Homemaker's Companion, the type of journal that features the serialized sublimations of ladies of letters who think in terms of delicate cup-like breasts, slim tapering waists, rich 
creamy thighs, eyes like wood smoke in autumn, fingers that smooth and caress like strains of music, bodies as powerful as Etruscan sculpture. Hi, the sky. Oh, this is Amanda Wingfield. How are you, honey? Well, I missed you at the D.A.R. last Monday. I, I said to myself, she's probably suffering from that sinus condition. Yeah, how is that sinus condition? Oh, hard. Heaven have mercy. <laughs> you're, a, you're a Christian martyr, honey. Huh? Yes, that's what you are, a Christian martyr. I just happened to notice now in my little book that your subscription to the companion's about to run out. Well, yes, yes, honey, it, it expires with the next issue. <laughs> well, I knew you wouldn't want to miss out on that wonderful new series starting in, in the new issue. <laughs> it's my best in May offer. You remember how gone with the wind took everybody by storm? <laughs> he said they couldn't go out if you hadn't read it. Yes, and all everybody talked with Scarlett O'Hara. <laughs> this is a book that our critics already compare with Gone with the Wind. Mmm, <laughs> it's the Gone with the Wind of the post-World War generation. <laughs> what? Oh, burn Oh, honey, now don't let them burn. Now you go take a look in the oven and I'll hold the wire.
just as far as the system of transportation could reach. Where are you going? I am going to the movies. Oh, I don't believe that lie. Well then, Mother, I am going to opium dance. Yes, I'm going to opium dance. Dance suffice in criminal hangouts, Mother. I've joined the Hogan gang. I have, Mother. I've got a Tommy gun and a violin case I carry around. I run a whole string of cat houses out in the valley. They call me Killer. Killer Wingfield, Mother. I'm just, a, I'm leading a double life. I'm just a simple, honest warehouse worker by day, Mother. And by night, I'm a dynamic czar of the underworld. <laughs> Look, Mother, I go to gambling casinos. I just spin away entire fortunes on a roulette wheel, Mother. I wear an eye patch. Sometimes I wear a mustache. And sometimes, Mother, I wear green whiskers. And on these occasions, they call me El Diablo. Oh, I could tell you things, Mother. I could tell you things that just make you sleepless. I've got enemies. I've got enemies that want to come in here, and they want to dynamite this place. Yeah, they want to come in here some night, and they just want to blow this whole place just sky high. And I'll be glad, Mother. I'll be very glad. And so will you. Because then, because then, Mother, you'll go up, up over Blue Mountain on your broomstick with your 17 gentlemen callers, you ugly, babbling bitch! <laughs> Door key. Where have you been all this time? I've been to the movies. All this time at the movies? Well, it was a very long program. They had a Barbo picture, and a Mickey Mouse, and a travelogue, and a newsreel, and a preview of coming attractions. Oh! Oh, and I almost forgot they had a uh, organ solo and a collection for the milk fund, simultaneously, which resulted in a terrible fight between an usher and a fat lady. <laughs> Did you have to stay through the whole thing? Well, of course. Oh, and I almost forgot, I almost forgot they had this, this huge stage show. And the headliner for this show was Mavolio the Magician. He performed wonderful many of them, such as uh, pouring water back and forth between pitchers. First, it turned into wine, and then it turned into beer, and then <coughs> it turned into whiskey. And I know that it was whiskey it finally turned into, because he needed someone to come up out of the audience to help, and I volunteered. Both shows. Kentucky straight bourbon. Very generous fellow. He gave away souvenirs. He gave
gave me this. <laughs> <laughs> this is his magic scarf, Laura. And you can have it. You wave this. You wave this over a canary cage. And you get goldfish. And then you wave it over the goldfish. intelligence to get yourself into a nailed up coffin. But who the hell ever heard of getting yourself out of one without even removing one nail? Rise and shine! Rise and shine! Laura, tell your brother to rise and shine. I'll rise, but I won't shine. Tell your brother his coffee's ready. Tom, it's nearly seven. Don't make mother nervous. Tom, speak to mother. Make up to, with her, apologize. She won't. She won't to me. She won't speak to me. She's the one that started not speaking. If you just say you're sorry, she'll start speaking. Is that such a tragedy, her not speaking? <laughs> please. Please. Laura, are you going to do what I asked you to do? Or do I have to get ready for <coughs> myself? I'm going. I'm going as soon as I get my coat. Sorry for what I said. I'm sorry for everything that I said. I didn't mean it. Devotion has made me a witch. And so I make myself hateful to my children. No, you don't. I no, worry so don't. much. I don't sleep. It makes me nervous. I understand that. I've had to put up a solitary battle all these years. But you're my right hand now. Don't fall down. Don't fail. I try, mother. Uh, try. Oh, you're just full of natural ability. Both of my children, and I'm so proud, happy. I feel I have so much to be grateful for, but, oh, promise me one thing, son. What's that, mother? Promise that you'll never be a drunkard. I'll never be a drunkard, mother. That's what worried me so, that you'd be drinking. Now, eat a bowl of Purina. No, I just want coffee, Mother. A shreddy wheat biscuit? No, no, just coffee. But you can't put in a day's work on an empty stomach? And your ten minutes don't go. Drinking too hot liquid makes cancer of the stomach. Put cream No, in. thank you, Mother. <laughs> to cool it. No! No, thank you, Mother. I just want it black. Well, I know, but it's not good for you. We, we have to do all we can to build ourselves up. Oh, in, in these trying times, all we have to cling to is each other. And that's why it's so important. Tom, I, I sent out your sister because I wanted to discuss something with you. If you hadn't spoken, I would have spoken to you. What is it, Mother? What is it you want to discuss? Laura. Oh, Laura. You know how Laura is so quiet? But still, waters run deep. 
She notices things, and I think she broods about them. A few days ago, I came in and she was crying. What about? You. Me. Yeah. She has an idea you're not happy here. Well, what gave her that idea? <laughs> <laughs> what gives her any idea? However, you do act strangely. Oh, I'm not criticizing. <coughs> Understand that. I know your your ambitions do not lie in the warehouse, and like everybody else in this whole wild world, you, you've had to make sacrifices. <coughs> Tom, uh, life is not easy. It, it calls for Spartan endurance. Oh, oh, there's so many things in my heart I cannot describe to you. Uh, I never told you. But I loved your father. I know that, Mother. And when I see you taking after his ways and staying out late, well, you had been drinking that night. You were in that terrifying condition. Lord says you hate the apartment and you go out nights to get away from her. Is that true, Tom? No. Mother, Mother, look. You say there's, there's things in your heart that you can't describe to me. It's the same thing with me, too. There's things in my heart that I just cannot describe but to you. But why, why, just respect why, why, Tommy, you're always so restless. Where do you go tonight? I, I go to the movies. Well, why do you go to the movies so much? Mother, I go to the movies because I like adventure. Adventure just, it's something you don't get much of down at the warehouse, so I just, I go to the movies. Well, you go to the movies entirely too much. Well, I like a lot of adventure. Well, most young men find adventure in their careers. Then young, most young men, mother, they don't work in the warehouse. Oh, the world is full of young men employed in warehouses and, and offices and, do all of them and find, factories. Do all of them find well, adventure do, in their they careers? Do, they do, or they do. Mother, oh, man, not everybody look, has a craze for adventure. Man, my instinct is a hunter and a lover and a fighter, and those instincts just don't get much play down at the warehouse. <laughs> man is by instinct. Now, don't you quote instinct to me. Instinct is something people have gotten away from. Christian adults don't want it. What do Christian adults want, mother? <laughs> Superior things. Things of the mind and the spirit. Only animals have to satisfy instinct. Well, surely your ambitions are somewhat higher than theirs, than monkeys and pigs. Well, I reckon they're not. I'll be joking. However, that isn't what mother, I want to discuss. I haven't much time. Now, you have five minutes? Mother, you want me to punch in red down Sit to where it Sit I want to talk about Laura. All right. All right, what about Laura? We have to be making some plans and provisions for her. It's six years since she's been out of high school and nothing's happened. She just drifts along doing nothing. Well, I guess she's the type that people call home girl. There's no such type of it. There is. It's a pity. Unless the home is hers with a husband. What? Oh, I, I can read the handwriting on the wall as plain as I see the nose in front of my face. Oh, it's terrifying. More and more, you remind me of your father. He was out to all hours without explanation, and then left, goodbye, and, and me with the bag to home. I saw that letter you got from the merchant marine. I know what you're dreaming. I'm not standing here blindfolded. Very well, then. I do it. Not until there's somebody to take your place. What do you mean? I mean that as soon as Laura has somebody to take care of her, marry, a home of her own, independent, why well, look, you'll be free to go wherever you please, and land, and see whichever way the wind blows you. But until that time, you, you've got to take care of your sister. Oh, I don't take me because I'm old and don't matter. I said for your sister, because she's young, Independent. I put her in business cards. It was a dismal failure. It, it frightened her so I made her sick to her stomach. I took her over to the Young People's League at the church, and it was another fiasco. She spoke to nobody, and nobody spoke to her. And now all she does is pull with these pieces of glass and play those worn-out phonograph records. Oh, what kind of life is that for a girl to leave? Mother, mother what can I do about it? Oh. Come selfishness. Self, self, self. And all you ever think of. Oh, oh where's your muffler? You forgot your wool muffler? Oh, Tom. Oh, I haven't said what I had in mind to ask you. Oh, down at the down at the warehouse. 
Aren't there some nice young men? No. Oh, there must be some. Mother. Now, now you find out one that is clean living, doesn't drink, and ask him out for sister. Oh, my gosh, Mother. For sister, to me, to get acquainted. Wingfield. How are you, honey? Oh, how, how's, how's that, that kidney condition? Hmm? Oh, oh, hard. Oh, you're a Christian martyr. Hey, is that what you are? You're a Christian martyr. I just now I'm to notice in my little black book that your subscription has just run out. Miss out on that wonderful new series starting in the new issue. It's by Bessie May Hoffman. Mm. It's the first thing she's written since Honeymoon for Three. <laughs> yeah, wasn't that a strange and interesting story? <laughs> well, this one is even lovely, I believe. It has a, a sophisticated society background. It, it's all about the horses set in Long Island. Will you do me a favor? What's that? Comb your hair. <laughs> you look so pretty when your hair's combed. You know, there's only one respect in which I would like you to emulate your father. What respect is that? The care he always took of his appearance. He never allowed himself to look untidy. Where are you going? I'm going out to get a smoke. Oh, you smoke too much. Mm. I pack a day. Right, 15 cents a pack. How much would that amount to in a month? 30 times 50 is how much tall? Now, you figure it out, and you'll just be astonished by what you could say to be enough to give you a high school course in the county of Washington News. Oh, just think what a wonderful thing that would be for you. I'd rather smoke. Mm. <laughs> I know. That's, that's the tragedy of me. Just across the alley, from our apartment, is Paradise Dance Hall. On evenings in spring, the windows and doors would be open, and the music would come outside. Sometimes the lights were turned off except for a large glass sphere which hung from the ceiling. It would turn slowly about, filtering the dust with delicate rainbow colors. In the orchestra, by a waltz or a tango, something with a slow and sensuous rhythm. Couples would come outside in the relative privacy of the alley. You could see them kissing behind ash pits and telephone this was a compensation they had for lives which passed like mine without adventure or change. Change and adventure are imminent this year. We're waiting just around the corner for all these kids, suspended in the, in the mists of a birch garden, caught in the folds of Chamberlain's umbrella. In Spain, there was revolution. Here, there was only hot swing music and liquor and bars and movies and sex. 
hung in the gloom like a chandelier and flooded the world with three deceptive rainbows. All the world was waiting for the bombardment. A fire escape landing is a poor excuse for a porch. What are you looking at? The moon. Oh, is it a moon tonight? It's rising over Garfinkel's delicate oh. testing. So it is a little silver slip of a moon. Have you made a wish on it yet? Mm-hmm. What'd you wish for? Oh, that's a secret. Oh, secret, huh? Well, I won't tell mine either. I'll be just as mysterious as you. Oh, I bet I can guess what yours is. Oh, my face so transparent. Well, you're not a space. No. No, I don't have secrets. I'll tell you what I wish for on the moon. Success and happiness for my precious children. I wish for that whenever there's a moon. And when there isn't a moon, I wish for it too. Well, I thought perhaps you'd wish for a gentleman caller. Why do you say that? Well, well, don't you remember asking me to fetch one? I remember suggesting it would be nice for your sister if you brought home a nice young man from the lot, from the, 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 the warehouse. I think I made that suggestion more than once. Yes, you've made it repeatedly. <laughs> well. Well. Gentlemen, call her. Oh, you, you mean you've asked some nice young man to come over? Yep. <laughs> I asked him to dinner. You really did? I did. You did? Oh, and, and did he accept? He did. Oh, that's <laughs> lovely. Well, I thought you'd oh, be pleased. Oh, it's definite then. Very definite. Soon. Very soon. Oh, Tom, now you just start putting on here and tell me some things. Well, what things do you want to know? And actually, I'd like to know when he's coming. He's coming. Tomorrow. Tomorrow? Yep, tomorrow. Oh, but Tom. Yes, Mother? But tomorrow gives me no time. Time for what? Preparation. <coughs> Why didn't you phone me at once? As the minute you knew, as soon as he accepted the... Oh, and don't you see, I, I could have been getting ready. Mother, there's no need to make any fuss. Oh, fuss? Oh, Tom, Tom, of course I had to make a fuss. I want things nice, not sloppy, not just thrown together. Oh, I I don't know why you have to think at all. <laughs> you just don't know. Oh, my wedding silver has to be polished. Oh, the monogram table in ought to be long. First curtains have to be put up and, oh, how about clothes? Uh, have to wear something, don't we? Mother, this boy is no one to make any fuss over. You mean uh, that this is the first young man we've introduced to your sister? Oh. It's terrible, dreadful, disgraceful. That poor little sister has never had a single gentleman call her. Now, Tom, come on inside. What for? I want to ask you some things. Mother, if you're going to make such a fuss, I'll just call him up. I'll tell him not to come. Oh, you just... certainly won't do anything of the kind. Now, nothing makes people more more hurt than broken engagement. It simply means I just have to look like a Turk. Or we won't let it break him, but we'll pass inspection. Now, come on inside and sit down. Any particular place you want me to sit? Thank heaven. I have that sofa. I'm also making payments on the new floor that I'm to set out. <coughs> and I'll take this old cover off. It'll brighten things up. Oh, oh, of course, I hope to get the walls repapered. <laughs> what, what is this young man's name? His name is O'Connor. Oh, that, of course, means fish. Oh. Tomorrow's Friday. <laughs> <laughs> what does he do? Works at the warehouse? Of course he works at the warehouse. How else would I... Tom, um, he doesn't drink. Why do you ask me that? Well, your father did. But just don't get started oh, on that, Mother. He does drink, then. Not that I know of. Oh, well, you make certain to be sure. Now, the last thing I want for my daughter is a boy who drinks. Mother, aren't you being a little bit premature? Mr. O'Connor has not yet arrived upon the scene. But will tomorrow to meet your sister. And what do I know of these cows? Nothing. Old maids are better off than wives of drunkards. Oh, my God. Oh, be still. Mother, lots of fellas meet girls who they don't marry. Now, you just talk sensibly, Tom. <laughs> and, and don't be soft. Yeah. What do you 
doing? I'm brushing that carrot down. What is this young man's position in the warehouse? This young man's position at the warehouse, Mother, is that of shipping clerk. Oh, it sounds to me like a fairly responsible job. It's not a job you'd be in if you had more get-up. What's his salary? I Have you any idea? I would judge it to be approximately $85 a month. Oh, well, not Prince. Well, it's $20 more than I make. Mm, how well I know. However, for a family man, $85 a month is not much more than you can just get by on. Mother, Mr. O'Connor is not a family man. <laughs> well, he might be, mightn't he, sometime in the future. Oh, I see. Plans and provisions. You're the only young man I know. I know the fact that the future becomes the present. The present the past. And the past leads to everlasting regret if you don't plan for it. Well, I'll think about that and see where I can come up with. There. Now, don't you be supercilious with your mother. Now, you tell me some more about this young, what do you call him? His name is O'Connor. James D. O'Connor. The D is for Delaney. Irish on both sides. Gracious and doesn't drink. Mother, do you want me to call you? <laughs> no, no, no. The only way to handle these things is to make discreet inquiries at the proper time. Now, when I was a girl in Blue Mountain, and I was suspected that a young man drank, the girl whose attentions he had been paying, well, if any girl was, would sometimes speak to the minister of the church, and, and or a rather father would if her father were living and sort of feel him out on the young man's couch. Now, that is the way things are discreetly handled to keep a young woman from making a tragic mistake. Well, then, how did you happen to make such a tragic mistake? <laughs> well, that, that innocent look of your father had everybody fooled. <laughs> He's smart. And the world was enchanted. Mm, no girl can do worse than to put herself at the mercy of a handsome appearance. <laughs> I hope Mr. O'Connor's not too good looking. No, he's not too good looking. He's covered with freckles and he hasn't got much of a nose. <laughs> not right down homely, though. No, he's not downright homely. He's just medium homely, I'd say. <laughs> <coughs> Character, what to look for in a man. That's what I've always said, Mother. <laughs> <laughs> You've never said anything of the kind. And I suspect you would never give it a thought. Well, now, don't be so suspicious of me. He's, I hope he's the, the type that's up and coming. I think he goes in for self -improvement. Oh, what makes you think so? <laughs> because he's taking a night course. Oh, splendid. What does he do? I mean, study. He's studying radio engineering and public speaking. Oh, then he has visions of advancement in the world. Any young man who studies public speaking is aiming for an executive job. Oh, public a radio engineer? That's a thing of the future. Those two facts are very illuminating. Now, those, those are the sort of facts a, a mother should know about any young man who comes to call on her daughter. Seriously or not? Mother, there's just one little word of warning here. I didn't tell him about Laura. I didn't let on that we had dark ulterior motives. I just said, why don't you come to dinner? He said, okay. And that was the whole conversation. Oh, I bet it was. You were as eloquent as an oyster. <laughs> <laughs> However, you know about Laura when he gets here. And, and when he sees how, oh, how lovely and sweet and pretty she is, he'll thank his lucky stars he was asked for dinner. Mother, mm -hmm. you mustn't expect too much out of Laura. <clears throat> what do you mean? Laura seems all those things to us because she's ours and we love her. We don't even notice she's crippled don't anymore. Don't say crippled, you know. I never allow that word to be used. Face facts, Mother. She is. And that's not all. What do you mean, not all? Laura is very different than other girls. Well, I think the difference is all to her, to her advantage. Well, it's not quite all to her advantage. To other people, to strangers, she lives in a world of her own. She's very shy. And those things make her just a little bit peculiar to people who live outside the house. Don't say peculiar. Mother, face facts, she is. In what way is she peculiar, my ass? Mother, she lives in a world of her own. She lives in a world of little class ornaments. She plays old phonograph records, and that's about all. Where are you going? I'm going to go to the movies. Ah, uh, not to the movies. Every night to the movies. I don't believe you always go to the movies. Oh. Laura? Laura? Yes, Mother? Now you let those dishes go and come out here. 
over your left shoulder, Laura. Over your left shoulder, honey. And, and make a wish. Now, darling. Wish. Oh, what shall I wish for, Mother? Happiness. Good fortune. <laughs> mm. So, the following evening, I brought Jim home to dinner. I'd known Jim slightly in high school. In high school, he was a hero. He had a tremendous Irish nature and vitality, with a scrubbed and polished look of fine china wear. He seemed to move in a continual spotlight. He was a star in basketball. He was the captain of the debating team. He was president of the senior class and the Glee Club, and he sang the male lead in the annual light opera. He seemed to always be running or bounding, never just walking. He always seemed at the point of defeating the law of gravity. He was shooting with such velocity through his adolescence that one would logically expect him to arrive at nothing short of the White House by the time he was 30. But apparently Jim ran into some interference after his graduation from Solon. His speed had definitely slowed. Six years later, he was holding a job at the warehouse that wasn't much better than mine. I was the only one at the warehouse with whom Jim was on friendly terms. I was looked upon as someone who could remember his former glory, someone who had seen him win basketball games in the Silver Cup and debating. And he knew of my secret practice of retiring to a cabinet in the washroom to work on my poetry when business at the warehouse was slack. He called me Shakespeare. And while the other boys at the warehouse regarded me with a suspicious hostility, Jim <coughs> took a humorous attitude toward me. And gradually, his attitude affected the others. Their hostility wore off, and they also began to smile at me as one smiles at an oddly fashioned dog that trots across the path at some distance. I knew that Jim and Laura had known each other at Solden. I heard Laura speak admiringly of his voice. I didn't know if Jim remembered Laura or not. In high school, Laura was as unobtrusive as Jim was astonishing. If Jim did remember Laura, it wasn't as my sister. But when I asked him to dinner, he grinned at me and said, Shakespeare? I never thought of you as having folks. Well, he was just about to discover that I did. Why are you trembling? Well, Mother, you've made me so nervous. Oh, I don't understand you, Laura. You couldn't be satisfied with just sitting at home, yet every time I'm trying to arrange the things for you, you seem to resent it. Now, now just take a look at yourself. Oh, oh, wait a minute. I have an idea. Who's it now? Oh, they call them gay deceivers. I won't wear them. Oh, you will. Why should I? Oh, because to be painfully honest, your chest is black. Oh, you make it seem like you're setting a trap. <laughs> All pretty girls are trapped. And, and men expect them to be pretty traps. Now, now look at yourself, young man. Now just look at yourself. 
so. Oh, oh, this is the prettiest you will ever be. I've got to fix myself now. You couldn't be surprised by your mother's appearance. Oh, oh, it's not dark enough yet. Oh, I'm going to show you something. I'm going to make a spectacular appearance. What is it, mother? Oh, is that your soul? I led the continuum. I won the cake walk twice at sunset. Yeah. <laughs> well, one spring, the governor's ball in Jackson. Oh, just see how I sashayed around the room, Laura. <laughs> I wore it on Sunday, to my gentleman call. I had it on the day I met your father. Well, I had malaria fever all that spring. Changed the climate from East Tennessee to the Delta, weak and resistant. I had a little temperature all the time. Oh, not enough to be serious. Just enough to make me restless and giddy. Oh, invitations, pouring, parties all over the Delta. Mother said, stay in bed and have a fever. I just wouldn't. I took crying out and kept going, going. Evening, days, <coughs> afternoon. Long, long ride. Oh, picnic. <laughs> oh, so lovely. That country in May. Oh, Lacey was dog, literally flooded with junk wool. That was a spring. I had the craze for junk wool. <laughs> junk wool became absolute obsession. I just said, oh, honey, there's no more room for junk wool. And still, I kept on bringing in more junk. <laughs> oh, I made the young man help me gather them. And it was a joke. Amanda and a junk. <laughs> oh. There were no more vases to hold them. But every available space was filled with junk. <laughs> no more vases to hold them. Is the matter with 
you, you silly thing. Please, you answer it, please. Oh, no, no, no. Now, I told you I wasn't going to humor you, Lord. Now, why have you chosen this moment to lose your mind? Please, 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 you go. You have to go to the door, because I can't. I can't, I can't. Why? I'm sick. Huh? Well, I'm sick, too. I'm sick of your nonsense. Now, why can't, why can't you and your brother be normal people? Oh, fantastic wins. My behavior and preposterous goings on. Can you give me one reason? Can you give me one reason? Why? Come and be there just a second. Why you are afraid to answer the door? Now, now you answer it, answer it, Laura. Laura Wing, you march right to that door. Shakespeare had a sister. How do you do? Okay. Your hand's cold, Laura. Yes, well, I've been playing the Victrola. Well, you must have been playing classical music on it. You gotta play a little hot swing music to warm me up. Excuse me. I haven't finished playing the Victrola. What was the matter? With Laura? Ah, oh, Laura, she's just terribly shy, that's all. Shy? You know, it's unusual to meet a shy girl. I don't believe you ever mentioned you had a sister. Well, now you know, I've got one. All right, it's supposed to Spanish. You want a piece of it? Yeah. What do you want? Comics? Ha <laughs> ha, sports. Hey, see old Dizzy Dean is on bad behavior again. Yeah? Yeah. That guy. Where are you going? Well, I'm going out on the terrace. You know, Shakespeare, I'm going to sell you a bill of goods. Okay. What goods? Of course I'm taking. Yeah? The public speaking. You and me, you and me. We're not the warehouse type. Well, that's good news. <coughs> well, what's public okay. speaking got to do with it? Well, it fits a poor executive position. Nah. I'll tell you, it's going to help out with In what respect? In everything. Ask yourself, what's the difference between you and me and the men in the office down front? Brains? Ability? Then what? Huh? <coughs> Just one little thing. What's that? One little thing. Primarily it amounts to social force. The ability to square up to a person and hold your own on any social level. A job? Yes, mother. Is that you and Mr. O'Connor? Yes, mother. Wait, you can make yourself comfortable in there. Uh, no, no, thank you, ma'am. Took care of that down at the warehouse. Tom. Yeah? Tom, uh, Mr. Mendoza was speaking to me about you. Favorably? <laughs> what do you think? Uh, you're gonna be out of a job soon if you don't wake up. I'm waking up. Mm -hmm. You show no signs. The signs are interior. I'm planning to change. I'm right in the middle of committing myself to a future that doesn't include the warehouse and Mr. Mendoza, or even a night course in public speaking. What are you gassing about? I'm tired of the movies. The movies? Yeah, the movies. Look at them. Look at all those glamorous people, having adventures, hogging it all, gobbling the whole thing up. You know what happens? People go to the movies instead of moving. Hollywood characters are supposed to have adventures for everybody in America while everybody in America just sits in a dark room and watches them happen. Yes, until there's a war. Yeah. And then the adventure becomes available to the masses. It's everybody's dish, not just Gables. Then any, everybody that's in the dark rooms just comes out of the dark room to have themselves some adventure. Well, goody, goody. It's our turn now. It's our turn now to go to a South Sea Island to make a safari. To be exotic, to be far off. But I'm not patient enough. I can't wait until then. I'm tired of the movies and I want to move. Move? Yeah, move. Well, soon. Where? Where, where, where? Look. Look, I'm boiling inside. I know, I know, I know. I seem 
and dreamy, but inside I am boiling. You know, every time I pick up a pair of shoes, I shudder, thinking how short life is, and what am I doing? Whatever that is, it doesn't include shoes, unless they're on a traveler's feet. <laughs> Look here. What? I'm a member of the Union of Merchant Seamen. I paid my dues last month instead of the light bill. Oh, you'll regret it when they turn the lights off. Hey, I'm not going to be here. <laughs> yeah, I'll buy your flight. <laughs> Look, I'm the son of my father. I'm the bastard son of a bastard. You see his picture grinning in there? And he's been gone, going on 16 years. Ah, uh, you're just talking, sir. How's your mother feel about it? Look. Here she comes. Look, my mother's not acquainted with these plans, all right? Where is everybody? All right on the terrace, mother. Oh. Take you into the living room and, and 
sit in the living room, Lord. First time the sofa. <coughs> oh, God. Standing over that hot stove all the afternoon has made us sick. I, I thought it was just too warm this evening, but... Is Laura all right now? Is she all right now, Tom? Yes, yes, she's all right now. <sighs>
get drunk. <laughs> uh, where shall I set the candles? Uh, anywhere. Well, how about here on the floor? Any objections? Oh. Well, I'll spread a newspaper under it. Catch the drippings. I like to sit on the floor. Mind if I do? No. Give me a pillow. What? A pillow. Well, how about you? Don't you like to sit on the floor, too? Yes. Well, why don't you? Take a pillow. I can't hardly see you sitting way over there. Well, I can see you. I know, but that's not fair. I'm in the limelight. Good. Now I can see you. Comfortable. Yes. So am I. Comfortable as a cow. <laughs> will you have some gum? No, thank you. Well, I think that I will indulge you. With your permission. Think of the fortune made by the guy that invented the first piece of chewing gum. Amazing, huh? You know, the Wrigley Building is one of the sites of Chicago. I saw it when I went up to the Century of Progress. Did you take in the Century of Progress? No, I didn't. Well, it was quite a wonderful exposition. What impressed me most was the Hall of Science. It gives you an idea what the future will be like in America. Even more wonderful than the present time is. <laughs> Say, your brother tells me you're shy, is that right? <laughs> I judge you to be an old-fashioned type of girl. Well, I think that's a pretty good type to be, too. Hope you don't think I'm being too personal with you. I think I will take a piece of gum if you don't mind. Mr. O'Connor, mm. have you kept up with your singing? Singing? Me? Yes. I remember what a beautiful voice you had. When did you hear me sing? You say you heard me sing. Yes, yes, very often. I don't suppose you remember me at all. <laughs> you know, I've had an idea I've seen you before. Well, I had that idea as soon as you opened the door. But it seemed almost like I was about to remember your name. Uh, but the name that I started to call you wasn't a name. Well, so I stopped myself before I said it. Wasn't it Blue Roses? <laughs> Blue roses? My gosh, yes, blue roses. <laughs> well, that's what I had on my tongue when you opened the door. Oh, isn't it funny what tricks your memory plays? Oh, I didn't connect you with high school somehow or another. But that's where it was. It was high school. Hmm. Oh, I didn't even know you were Shakespeare's sister. Gosh, I'm sorry. Oh, I didn't expect you to. You hardly knew me. But we had a speaking acquaintance, huh? Yes, we did. When did you recognize? Right away. As soon as I came in the door. As soon as I heard your name, I thought it was probably you. I mean, I knew that Tommy stood on you a little in high school. When you came in the door, yes, then I was sure. <laughs> Why didn't you say something? I didn't know what to say. I was surprised. <coughs> For goodness sake. You know, this sure is funny. Yes, isn't it, though? <laughs> didn't we have a class in something together? Yes, we did. Ah, what class was that? It was singing chorus. Ah. I sat across the aisle from you, Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> now I remember. You always came in late. Yes, well, and it was so hard for me getting up the stairs. I had that brace on my leg. It clumped so loud. I never heard any clumping. To me, it sounded like thunder. Well, well, well. I never even noticed. And everyone was seated before I came in, and I didn't walk in front of all those people. My seat was in the back row, and I was clumping up the aisle with everyone watching. Well, you shouldn't have been self-conscious. Well, I know, but I was. Well, it was always such a relief when the singing started. Uh, yes, I placed you now. I used to call you Blue Roses. <laughs> How did I get started calling you that anyway? I was out of school with an attack of chlorosis. When I came back, you asked me what the matter was. I said, Roses, and you thought that I said... Blue Roses. So that's what you always called me after that. Oh, I hope you didn't mind. Oh, no. <laughs> I liked it. I mean, you see, I wasn't acquainted with very many people. Well, as I remember, you sort of stuck by yourself. Yes. I never have had much luck at making friends. Well, I don't see why you would. I started out badly. Uh, you mean... Well, yes. It sort of stood between me and... You shouldn't have left. I know, but I did. You were shy with people. I 
tried not to be, but I could never... Overcome. No, I never could. <laughs> I guess being shy, well, it's something you have to work out kind of gradually. Yes, I guess it is. It takes time. Yes. You know, people are not so dreadful when you get to know them. Well, that's what you have to remember. I mean, everybody's got problems. Well, not just you, but practically everybody's got some kind of problem. You know, you think of yourself as having the only problems, and, well, being the only one is disappointing. Just look around. You'll see lots of people as disappointed as you are. For instance, I hoped when I was going to high school, I'd be a lot further along at this time. Well, six years later than I am now. <laughs> Do you remember that wonderful write-up I had in the torch? Yes. Said it was bound to succeed. Anything I went into. Holy jeez, the torch! <laughs> Here you are in the Pirates of Penzance. Oh, I sang the baritone lead of that operetta. So beautifully. Oh. Yes. Yes, beautifully. Oh, beautifully. You heard me. All three times. No. All three performances. Yes. What? I wanted to ask you to autograph my program. Well, why didn't you ask me to? Well, you were always surrounded by your own friends, so much so. Ah, you should have just. I know, but I thought you might think I was. Thought this. I might think you was what? <sighs> oh, I, I was beleaguered by females in those days. <laughs> oh, you were terribly popular. <laughs> yeah. And you had such a friendly way. I was spoiled in high school. Everyone liked you. Including you. Yes, I did too. Well, well. give me that program, Mom. signature's not worth much right now, but someday maybe it'll increase in value. <coughs> you know, being disappointed is one thing, ah. and being discouraged is something else. Well, I am disappointed, but I'm not discouraged. I'm 23 years old. How old are you? I'll be 24 in June. <laughs> That's not old age. No, but I You didn't... finished high school. I didn't go back. Didn't mean you dropped out. I made bad grades on my final examination. Oh, that crowd head! <laughs> Why do you call her that? Well, that's what she was. You mean you're not still going with her? I never see her. So in the personal section, you were engaged. I know. I wasn't impressed by that propaganda. So it wasn't the truth? Oh, only in Emily's optimistic opinion. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> judge to be the trouble with you. Inferiority complex. Well, do you know what that is? Well, that's what they call it when someone low rates it. So. Oh, I, I understand it because I had it too. Although my case wasn't as aggravated as yours seems to be. <laughs> I had it until I took a public speak and developed my voice and learned I had an aptitude for songs. You know, before that time, I never thought of myself as being outstanding in any way whatsoever. 
Well, I've never made a regular study of it. But I do have a friend who says I can analyze people better than doctors that make a profession of it. Oh, I don't claim that to be necessarily true. But I sure can guess a person's psychology. Oh, excuse me. I always take it out when the flavor is gone. <laughs> I'll use a scrap piece of paper to wrap it. I know how it is when it gets stuck on your shoe. <laughs> yep, that's what I judge to be the principal trouble with you. A lack of confidence in yourself as a person. But you don't have the proper amount of faith in yourself. Well, I'm basing that fact on a number of your remarks and on certain observations I've made. For instance, <coughs> that, uh, well, that clumping you thought was so awful in high school. Well, you say you even dreaded to walk into class. But well, well, do you see what you did? You dropped out of school, you gave up an education, all because of a, well, a clone, which as far as I know was practically non-existent. A little physical defect is all you have. Hardly noticeable either. Magnified a thousand times by your imagination. You know what my strong advice to you is. Think of yourself, well, think of yourself superior in some way. What way would I think? Oh, my man alive, love. Look around. What do you see? Hmm? A world full of common people. All of them born, all of them gonna die. Now, which one of them has one tenth your good point? Or mine? Or anyone else's as far as that goes? <laughs> Gosh almighty. Everybody excels in one thing. Some in many. All you have to do is discovering what. Well, take me, for instance. My interests happen to lie in electrodynamics. I'm taking a course in radio engineering at high school. Laura, on top of a fairly responsible job at the warehouse, I'm taking that course and studying public speaking. Oh. Because I believe in the future of television. Oh, I wish to be ready to go right up along with it. Therefore, I'm planning to get in on the ground floor. In fact, I've already made the right connection. That remains is for, is for the industry itself to get underway. Full steam, knowledge, zip, money, zip, power, boo! Oh, that's the cycle democracy's built on. <laughs> oh, I, I guess you think I think a lot of this. So. Oh, well, I... now, how about you? <laughs> isn't, there, well, isn't there something you take more interest in than anything else? Well, I do, as I said, have my glass collection. <laughs> I'm not sure I know what you're talking about. What kind of glasses? Um, little articles of it. I mean, they're ornaments, mostly. Most of them are, um, animals made out of glass. See, the tiniest little animals in the world. Mother calls them a glass menagerie. Here is an example of one, if you'd like to see it. This one is the oldest. It's nearly 13. Wow. Careful. I mean, if you breathe, it breaks. Oh, I better not take it. I'm pretty clumsy with things. Oh, well, go on. I trust you. shines through him? Sure does shine. I shouldn't be partial, but he's my favorite one. And what kind of thing is this one supposed to be? Haven't you noticed a single horn on his forehead? A unicorn, huh? Hmm? Unicorns. Aren't they extinct in the modern world? I know. <laughs> Poor little fellow must feel kind of lonesome. Well, if he does, he doesn't say anything about it. I mean, he sits on the shelf with some of the other horses that don't have horns. They all seem to get along very nicely together. Mm, how do you know? Well, I haven't heard any arguments out of them. Mm, no arguments, huh? Well, that's a pretty good sign. Where shall I set? Um, put him on the table. They all like a change of scenery once in a while. A 
Look how big my shadow is when I stretch. in disguise. You'll never forgive me. I bet that was your favorite piece of glass. Oh, no. I don't have favorites much. It's no tragedy, Beckles. Glass, it breaks so easily, and no matter how careful you are, traffic jars, the shelves, things fall off them. <laughs> Still, I'm awfully sorry I was the cause. I'll just imagine that he had an operation, and the horn was removed to make him feel less freakish. And now he'll feel more at home with the other horses, the ones that don't have horns. That's very funny. Glad to see you have a sense of humor. <coughs> you know, you're, well, you're very different. Surprisingly different from anyone else I know. Do you mind me telling you that? I mean it in a nice way. Ah, well, you make me feel sort of like... Oh, I, I don't know how to put it. I'm usually pretty good at expressing things. Now, this is something I don't know how to say. Has anyone ever told you you are pretty? Who you are. A very different way. I wish you were my sister. I teach you to have some confidence in yourself. Well, the, the different people are not like other people. But being different is nothing to be ashamed of. Because other people are not such wonderful people. There were 100 times in a thousand. There were one time in a thousand. They walk all over the earth. Well, you just stay here. They're as common as weeds. You, uh, well, you're blue roses. But blue is wrong for roses. It's right for you. You're pretty. In what respect am I pretty? In all respects. Believe me. Your eyes. up because I'm invited to dinner and have to be nice. Oh, I could do that. I, I could put on an act for you, Laura, and say lots of things that 
build your confidence up. Make you proud instead of shy. Shouldn't have done that. That's way off the beat. You don't smoke, do you? Would you care for a mint? A peppermint lifesaver? My pocket's a regular <laughs> drugstore wherever I go. <coughs> you know, Laura, if I had a sister like you, I'd be the same as her. I bring out fellas, introduce her to them. Well, the right type of type to appreciate her. Only, uh, well, he made a mistake about me. Well, maybe I've got no call to be saying this. That, that might not have been the idea to have me over. Well, but what if it was? There's nothing wrong with that. It's, it's just the trouble in my case. I'm not in the situation to do the right thing. Can't take down your number and say I'll phone. I can't call you up next week and ask you for a date. Just thought I'd better explain the situation in case you misunderstood it. And I hurt your feelings. You won't call again? No. Laura, I can't. As I was just explaining, I've got strings on me, Laura. I've been going steady. I I go out all the time with a girl named Betty. <coughs> oh, she's a regular homegirl like you. I'm like Catholic and Irish. In great many ways we get along fine. I met her last summer on a moonlight boat trip up the river to Alton on the Jets. Well, right away from the start was love. Love has made a new man out of me. The power of love is really tremendous. Love is something that changes the whole world. Though. It happened that Betty's aunt took sick. Well, she got a wire and had to go to Centralia. Well, well so Tom, when he asked me to dinner, I, I naturally just accepted the invitation. Well, not knowing that he, that, that you, that I... Oh, I'm just a... Say something. Souvenir. Oh, here's the delightful after that show. <coughs> I made you children a little liquid refreshment. Jim, you know that song about lemonade? Mm. Lemonade, lemonade, made in the shade, <laughs> stir for the snake. Good now, pretty old maid. Ooh, no, ooh I baptized that. myself. Oh, here, let me. Oh, Laura, you look so serious. Oh, we were having a serious conversation. Oh, well, good. Then you're better acquainted. You know, you modern young people are so much more serious than my generation. <laughs> oh, I was so gay as a girl. Oh, you haven't changed a bit. Oh, tonight I'm rejuvenated. Oh, the gaiety, the occasion, Miss Dolcon. Oh, I better put this down. Oh, about, uh, I discovered we had some maraschinos cherries, and I dumped them in juice and all. Oh, you shouldn't have gone to the trouble, Mrs. Wilson. Trouble? Trouble? Oh, it was loads of fun. Didn't you hear me cutting up in the kitchen? <laughs> the 
crazy. It's for burning. I told Tom how I've done I was with him for keeping you himself for so long. <laughs> but now you found your way here. I want you to be a frequent caller. Not just occasional, but all the time. <laughs> oh, we're going to have some gay time <coughs> together. Oh, I see them coming. <laughs> well, oh, breathe out air. Yeah. So fresh and, and the moon's so pretty. <laughs> well, I skip on back out. I know my place when young folk are having a serious conversation. <laughs> I don't go out, Mrs. Wingfield. But the fact of the matter is, I've got to be going. Going? Now? Oh, you must be joking. Well, it's only the shank of the evening, Mr. O'Connor. Well, you know how it is. Oh, oh, you mean you're a young working man. You have to keep working man hours. <laughs> well, that's all right. Now... What's the best evening for you? Isn't Saturday night the best night for you working then? Uh, got a couple of time clocks to punch, Mrs. Winkley. Oh. One at morning, another at night. You are ambitious. You work at night, too. <sighs> no, ma'am, not work. Uh, but Betty. Betty? Who's Betty? Oh, just a girl. The girl I go set in. Oh. <laughs> Oh, is, is this a serious romance, Mr. O'Connor? We're going to be married the second Sunday in June. Oh, well, nice. Tom didn't mention that you were engaged to be married. <coughs> well, the cat's not out of the bag at the warehouse. Well, you know how they are. They call you Romeo and stuff like that. It's been a wonderful evening, Mrs. Romeo. I guess this is what they mean by Southern hospitality. Oh, really wasn't anything at all. Well, I hope it don't seem like I'm rushing off. I promised Betty I'd pick up the Wabash Depot. By the time I get my old jalopy down there, her train will be in. Some women are pretty upset if you keep them waiting. Yes, I know. The tyranny of women. <laughs> well, goodbye, Mr. O'Connor. I wish you luck and happiness and success, all three of them. And so does Laura. Don't you, Laura? <clears throat> yes. Goodbye, Laura. I'm certainly going to treasure that souvenir you gave me. And don't forget the good advice I gave you. <coughs> so long, Shakespeare!
job. Don't think of anything but your own selfish pleasures. Just go, just go, go to the movies. All right. All right, I will. I'll go to the movies. The more you shout about my selfishness, the quicker I'll go. And I won't go just to the movies either. Oh, just go to the movies, you selfish dreamer. distance between two places. Not long after that, I got fired for writing a poem on the lid of a shoebox. I left St. Louis. I descended the steps of this fire escape for the last time, followed from then on in my father's footsteps, attempting to find in motion what was lost in space. I traveled around a great deal. The city swept about me like dead leaves, leaves that were brightly colored and torn from the branches. I would have stopped, but I was pursued by something. It always caught me unawares, taking me all together by surprise. Perhaps it was a familiar bit of music. Perhaps it was only a colored piece of glass. Perhaps I'm walking along some street at night in a strange city before I've found companions. I pass the lighted window of a shop that sells perfume. The window is filled with tiny colored pieces of glass, tiny transparent bottles of delicate colors, like pieces of a shattered rainbow. And all at once, my sister touches my shoulder, and I turn and I look into her eyes. Laura, Laura, I tried to leave you behind me, but I'm more faithful than I intended to be. I reach for a cigarette, I cross the street, I run into the movies or a bar, I buy a drink. Speak to the nearest stranger. Anything to blow your candles out. But nowadays the world is lit by lightning. Blow out your candles, Laura. 